you by Miller Lite and Luther Auto. And now, to kick off your NFL weekend, this is Vikings Live. Well, here we go this evening, trying to get our beloved Minnesota Vikings into the winner's circle, and we definitely have a Michigan bent this evening for the Detroit Lions are at U.S. Bank Stadium Sunday. Tyler Conklin tied in for the Vikings. He'll be here about 10 minutes from now. He grew up 35 minutes north of Detroit in Michigan, and one of our panelists, Ron Johnson, he was a star punter at Martin Luther King High School in the Motor City. This is Vikings Live, and your host is Don Mitchell. Oh, PA, thank you very much, Ron. That's one of the best introductions I've ever heard for you. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't either. We're, we're learning as we go. It's the Isn't first black punter in Detroit. <laughs> hey, when it comes to Detroit, you always you always diss the Lions, though. Yep. And uh, the Vikings, they say they have a great week of practice. They're getting ready to go. They have to get back on track. And you said, they're the Lions. That's what you always say. Yep. You feel good about this. I do. I mean, both both teams have found odd ways to win, but the Lions have a better history of losing weird games. I mean, it's just it's I don't know if they're cursed because of how they treated Barry Sanders and Calvin Johnson. I mean, who knows what it is, but it's just it has not gone well for them. Their center's out, Frank Ragnow, and I think that's the key. When you lose your staple, your middle guy, and you throw in Evan Brown all of a sudden, and you're expecting this guy to do what Frank Ragnow does. It hasn't worked out so far. But, Courtney, you know it's always tight between these teams, whether they like it or not, right? What do you see on game day? Well, the Vikings have a seven-game winning streak going against the Lions, so that's obviously good news. For whatever reason, Kirk Cousins plays tremendously. And he's 15 touchdowns to one interception in six wins over Detroit. So you'd like to think if history's on their side, that type of thing can repeat itself. But like Ron was saying, I mean, the Lions are winless right now. So that does, that kind of makes them, in my mind, a really dangerous team because they've been close in games. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily against Chicago last week, but you go back to that Baltimore game. Can you fault them for losing on a 66-yard field goal by Justin Tucker? No. Um, but I think it's it's a must-win situation, obviously, for Minnesota. I mean, the bye's coming up. You don't want to be 1-4 and four at this point. And you can't lose to Detroit when we're talking about where they stand in the division right now get a leg up early because you don't face many of your other division opponents until you know several weeks down the line when Green Bay comes here in November all right you talked about Kirk Cousins now he's coming off a game only had 200 plus yards he had his first pick of the season um, some people are saying bad cousins good cousins and we saw the other cousins Cortland we're going to start with you what did you see that was different I know maybe the pocket wasn't clean but mm -hmm. he wasn't the guy that we saw in the previous game. well I don't think he got any help from his run game right like they weren't able to establish the run against Cleveland they have an absolutely dominant defensive line so of course he's going to be under pressure and the offensive line didn't hold up the way that they were able to in previous weeks but also I mean like I think back to that final drive Don when they had a chance to go win the game and he He's checking down on several of those last plays and Mike Zimmer said you know the pass to Tyler Conklin um, you know that he had to run out of bounds for they were just trying to get closer to the end zone to throw the Hail Mary I've never heard of a 26 yard Hail Mary that's new to me so you know I was I, you know in my mind you got to take more shots at the end zone there it just kind of felt like everything came crumbling and stumbling into the finish line there and and that you know fell on Kirk Cousins at the end. Right. I mean, former wide receiver, you know this. He was having a hard time connecting with his go-to guy, Thielen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was forcing it. Like if you look at what Adam Thielen does, and and that even that interception there, he mm -hmm. threw it behind him. So you have to lead him. Again, I don't know if it was the Miles Garrett because Miles Garrett was putting Rashad Hill on his back almost every other play. It felt like, and I don't think he was comfortable. There was a play where KJ Osborne was wide open. If Kirk just steps to his left, he still looks down the field, kind of like Aaron Rodgers does. It's going to be an awkward throwing angle, but you get paid a lot of money to make that throw. I mean, we see Dak Prescott warm up and do the hip thrust because that's what quarterbacks have to do sometimes. You have to put your body in weird angles to be able to throw that ball. Pat Mahomes can do it. Aaron Rodgers can do it. Tom Brady can do it at the age of 50. And so Kirk Cousins, I don't know if it's when he felt pressure, he just thought, I need to run. But it's like if you feel pressure, get to a spot where you still can hit a wide open K.J. Osborne. So there were some plays that were missed, but that happens. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's going to watch film and realize, like, man, I missed that one because that's what pros do, and he has to move on. 
You know, Courtney, you, you brought up the fact that he didn't have help with the run game, mm -hmm. right? And it always starts with the run game. But when you look at the numbers, 34 yards for Cook, 20 yards for Madison, they couldn't get that going either. And they need to do that this week. Yeah, and what we know right now is that Dalvin Cook hasn't practiced either day, which not, isn't necessarily a huge, huge concern considering... You know, he's a player who can sit out a week and be ready to go on Sunday, but he's still dealing with that ankle injury, Don. And he told us, yeah, I'm not 100%, but I'm at a point where it's more of like a pain management issue right now. How much can he push himself versus, you know, should he sit against the Lions? Like, theoretically, you should be able to beat the Lions with Alexander Madison, your backup, and be able to put Dalvin Cook on ice, keep him fresh for that game against Carolina so you can get another win going into the bye. But if they have to play him, Clint Kubiak said today that there's not going to be any wholesale changes if you're splitting carries again. So I would anticipate probably looking pretty similar in terms of like the load management thing as it did last week when they were, you know, volleying back and forth between Cook and Madison. Yeah, Ron, what do you think they need to do? Yeah, well, I mean, I agree with that. I, I would rest Dalvin Cook. Why? We saw what Alexander Madison can do against a really good Seattle's defense. And so when you have a guy like that that can get you 112 yards, you tell him early so he's mentally dialed in and ready to be RB1, I say do it. If Dalvin Cook's ankle's not ready to go, I heard him say, hey, it's all about pain management, which is true. In the NFL, it's if you're not hurt, because I don't, I hate that term, but either you're hurt or you're injured. And my dad used to always say that. But you have to pick and choose. If you're just a little bit banged up and you can go, go. But in his instance, this is a 17-week season. You have to rest if you can get that rest and be ready to go for when they really need you. Because I don't think they're really going to need them. I mean, hopefully they don't, but I don't think they're really going to need them against the Lions. And that's kind of the problem is, like, guys are, are pushing the issue. But the Lions are chasing history. And we have to remember that. Nobody's ever gone 0-17. <laughs> so they're trying to get to do something that nobody's ever done before. And so I'm, I'm watching it. You know, so also for the defense, you, you want to limit, right? You, you want to show what you can do. You want to be dominant. But sometimes the defense has taken a little bit, Courtney, to get going. Yeah. You know, we see them in the second half. They, they can't afford to have a slow start. No, and I think the thing that was the big issue this past week against Cleveland was obviously the run defense. Now, Mike Zimmer says he's not concerned about it because outside of that you know, third and 20 draw play, that's exactly what you're going to get. Uh, in that type of situation that he felt the run defense actually played pretty well. The good news is, at least we anticipate right now, that's why I'm saying it so deliberately, is that <laughs> Anthony Barr, as Mike Zimmer said earlier in the week, and Barr talked to us on Wednesday, he is expected to play, make his season debut here in uh, week five of the season. So, I mean, if they can get Barr in there, that should certainly help the run defense in ways that maybe we haven't seen earlier in the year. Because remember, Mike Zimmer said there's things that they haven't done because Barr hasn't been in there. And you'd like to think that that adds another element to what they need to do to be able to get back on track. And like you said, Don, put a complete game together. Yeah, they've got to do it, right, Ron? Yeah, I mean, like you said, Anthony Barr is a calming effect. He's out there. Him and Eric Kendricks have gotten along since college. And so when you add that guy in there, it's just a trust factor that Kendricks can say, I'm going to go do this because I know Anthony's going to do this. There was a lot of guys sometimes making plays and doing things that weren't within the game plan, and Coach Patterson said that. Sometimes guys want to put that cape on and be Superman, but I think when Anthony Barr gets back out there, him and Kendricks are less likely to do that because they can trust each other and they don't have to feel like they have to be Superman. And it adds on the back end, too. If, if, if I'm a cornerback and I know we're in cover two and I know Anthony Barr has the hook zone flat, he's going to be in the hook zone flat because he knows the job. And I think that's the key is getting a guy back out there that everybody can trust. Nothing against the other guys, mm -hmm. but it's just different when you get your guy back. You, know, you mentioned upping Superman. Andre Patterson doesn't want his defensive linemen to be Superman either, right? He just says, hey, let's not focus on sacks. They're a byproduct. We want to have more pressure. So today he was saying the difference between that. He said in, in a single season, you have to about 450 to maybe 500 snaps with 12 sacks, and that means you're a pro bowler. Um, 
that's not a stat that he wants you to automatically focus on. There's pressures, there's quarterback hits, there's hurries. There's so much more that goes into the game where, you know, it's pretty obvious to tell if somebody's sad. Other in ways that we didn't see last year because of the way that the pass rush really lacked. All right, Ron, we're going to skip ahead to the Lions. I mean, like you said, they're 0-4. You have Jared Goff. Earlier, we talked about just how dangerous, though, a team can be because you do not want to lose at home to a team is struggling. People are calling them the lowly Lions, but they can't, they can't afford to let their guard down. Yeah, I mean, you always got to worry about your kneecaps around Dan Campbell. But when you look at the Falcons came in here last year, 0-5, that was the same message. It was, okay, this is a game they should win. Mm -hmm. And somehow they lost. Kirk Cousins came out through an early interception because he was reading the wrong guy, didn't see a linebacker there. So that's the things where I don't think you create a game plan and say we need to strike early against the Lions. No, you just need to, like Courtney said, establish the run, end up in third and short. Like the, the Browns were in third and short the entire day pretty much. I think there was like one or two times where they were not. But every single time Stefanski did a, did a great job of establishing the run. That's what the Vikings lack. That's what Zimmer wants. And so I think that's the key now is how can I get – and we know how Zimmer is with his coordinators. If eventually it doesn't work, he will voice his opinion about the run game. And so you want to establish a run, end up in second and short, third and short, so that Kirk has more plays and the defense can't really pin their ears back and come after Rashad Hill because that's what happened. Miles Garrett knew exactly what was going to happen. Third and seven, you got to pass. And that's where you put them in a bad position. Okay, now we're going to break down the video here, too. I mean, the Lions, they had their opportunities, but they seem to miss them. And that, that's what the Vikings are hoping. But tell us about these opportunities and how they blew them in the red zone. Yeah, this is a shoulder fumble. I mean, he's coming up to identify the mic, and the center can't hear it. So he thinks he's saying hut, and he's actually identifying the mic. So as he's trying to identify a new mic because somebody's got the blitz, the dummy snaps it, and so that's the problem. Like, you have to pay attention and understand, but I don't know if Jared Goff didn't call him off. That's his fault, and here's another one where you're going to see Jared Goff talking about it with Frank Ragnow. Here's the front end. Guy walks into the, in the, to the hole. Penny Sewell is telling him, okay, now we have a new mic. I have new five, a new five. You snap the ball, but now who are you blocking? With Penny Sewell, he has to know between those two guys which guy is his guy, and we run it. You'll see. He steps up. And then he just doesn't get to him. Now, Jared Goff, they're going to blame it on him. It's not his fault. Like, he has no time to throw the ball. He was great with the Rams when they gave him a chance. And that's the key. You have to give him time to throw the ball. And the Lions can't figure out who the front five and who the blitzers are right now. All right. Well, Courtney, we were going to talk about how the good Goff. But we're going to yeah. put that on hold and talk to about, about that in a little bit. Well, when we come back, though, we have to guy that. Bleacher Report has said is the hidden gem, but he's not so hidden, is he? Nope. We're going to talk with Tyler Conklin. He's got a touchdown under his belt, and many defenses are well aware of him now. PA Talks to them when we come back. Don't go away.
brought to you by Miller Lite and Luther Auto. Well, if you want the perfect example of taking patience and then turning it into opportunity and making the most of them, it is our next guest, Tyler Conklin. He is joined with PA and Paul. Let me tell you, he knows how to wait and make the best of every opportunity, whether it's college, high school, or now. No doubt. And being a Chesterfield, Michigan native, Tyler Conklin, tied in for the Minnesota Vikings, grew up 35 minutes north of Detroit. And, you know, growing up in Michigan, were, were you a Detroit Lions fan? I wasn't a Lions fan. Um, I was more of a basketball guy. So, mm -hmm. And uh, I have a lot of Lions, a lot of friends that are Lions fans, mm -hmm. diehard Lions fans. But I just really never was a, I never even been to a Lions game until I played them. So. So, so instead of being like a tight end catching passes from Stafford, you wanted to be the guy who sat there and went, Detroit basketball. I would have rather been the guy out there playing, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, the, with the uh, Detroit Lions here, you know, the, the Lions fan base, I mean, they never go to the playoffs, yet the fan base always comes back to the games. What, what is that fan base like? What do you remember about it? Yeah, and like I said, never being to a game, it's kind of hard to speak on it in the atmosphere as I was playing there, but just from the people that I've been around in, the, in my community, and just, they are diehard fans, and they do love the Detroit Lions um, yeah. throughout the, you know, ups and downs, probably a little more downs than ups, but... Um, they don't compare to the fans we have here, that's for sure. Right, need to be loud this weekend, too, against these Lions, get to the Minnesota Vikings a victory. Now, when you started collegiately at Central Michigan, I read that you skipped a season or you were out a season early so you could gain 25 pounds. Now, I'm really hoping that's accurate because I'm just dying to know what you ate to gain 25 pounds. How you like it then? Um, it was more than 25 pounds, but I had to sit out when I transferred from basketball. It was just because I transferred and had to switch a divi switch division, so I had to sit out that year. And um, you know, I, I graduated high school about 185 pounds, Ooh. and then probably got to Northwood about 200. And with a, for my first year playing, I was 235, and then graduated at like 250. So really, from my senior year of high school to yeah. Uh, senior year was, of college was about 60 pounds. Yeah, now, and, and I mean, you're faster than people know because simply because you haven't had a ton of opportunity in three years, really until this year, that Seattle game, man, I mean, there was a play center of the field where you took off down the field, and it's like the fastest I've ever seen you run. I mean, uh, do, are you considered a fast tight end with it within the room or within the league? Because, man, you were lickety split. Yeah, I wish I would have scored right there, but... Um... <laughs> Yeah, I like to think I'm considered a fast tight end, kind of like you said, without the opportunity to show your speed or show your athleticism, you kind of can get, you know, put into a certain a certain box or kind of be labeled as, as such. But uh, yeah, I like to think I'm a pretty athletic tight end. Now, I mean, tw 20 might be your favorite number. I mean, seriously, it's December 20th of 2020. Your first touchdown went for 20 yards from Kirk Cousins. Will you ever forget that one? And did you get a chance to keep the ball? Yeah, I have the ball, and no, I won't. I mean, I thought for a little bit, I thought I was cursed there for a while. Three years, <laughs> no touchdowns. I remember there was like a, there was a play against Seattle, wide open in the back of the end zone. Adam makes the guy fall, so he gets a touchdown, which rightfully so. I mean, yeah. he's wide open too. But I was like, I was the number one read, so I'm starting to think like, ah, oh, maybe I'm just cursed. Man, I'm never gonna get a touchdown. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, so, so good. scoring that touchdown was definitely. Uh, it was a big moment. Yeah, and then it's a big moment. First touchdown in the National Football League. You look up, hello, hello. I mean, it's like, where's the roar? Yeah, that was that was definitely weird, and especially like we talk about. I mean, since my rookie year, we've always talked about it. Ah, you're going to get it this week. You're going to get one this week. And uh, like you say, no fans there, but then hearing them this year uh, yeah. after scoring a touchdown was, was unreal. Well, that I mean, your, your second career touchdown in that Seattle game, man, that was a big touchdown, and, and it was the first regular season home game since 2019. You heard it that day. That's something you're never going to forget, right? No, it was awesome. The, state, the, the stadium and the fans that day in general were, um, were electric. Last one. Uh, for our, our brethren in Holly, Minnesota watching, Ben Ellison, second-year NDSU. He's in the room. Sneaky good run blocker. What's it been like working with Ben? Yeah, great dude. Uh, we, got a really, we got really good chemistry in that room just with everybody, but Ben's a really good dude, um, really good blocker. Uh, and I think he's a great asset to our room in general. Got to beat those kiddies this weekend. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Thank you. I appreciate Tyler it. Tyler Conklin, Miss Don Mitchell. All right, that's awesome. Maybe you get touchdown number two coming up on Sunday. Right now, we're going to take a live look into Seattle. This is the very first football on Fox tonight, Thursday night football out in Seattle, Lumen Field right there. When we come back, we'll check in a little bit and talk about the Rams and the Seahawks. And we'll also get Courtney Iran's keys to how the Vikings...
Welcome back to Vikings Live. Brought to you by Miller Lite and Luther Auto. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to toss over to Paul Allen, PA. You can wax poetic like no other. What is your word's eye view? Well, I don't know about going uh, Edgar Allan Poe on this thing right now, but I can tell you the word's eye view into this game. Obviously, the Minnesota Vikings need a victory. Obviously, they rarely lose to Detroit. Just protect Kirk Co Cousins. 15 touchdowns, one interception, yards per attempt against the Lions, 10 and a half, 6 and 0 wearing these colors. He will shred this team if you just give him a little time, and that will pave the way for a Minnesota Vikings victory. That's the words I view, Ms. Dawn. All right. Thank you, PA. Well, Courtney, we're going to start with you on your keys to the game. What do the Vikings do to win this game? Well, take advantage of the fact that they're without two of their starting offensive linemen. We know that Frank Ragnow went to IR this week. Uh, Panay Sewell, Anthony Lynn, their offensive coordinator, said that they're preparing not to play with him. Uh, we saw what happened when Evan Wood took over at center last week for the Lions. He snapped the ball into Jared Goff's helmet, and then it went into the hands of a defensive lineman for the Chicago Bears. This is already an <laughs> offensive line that's given up 68 pressures through four games. They are depleted. So if you're Andre Patterson, you scheme up everything you possibly can. Remember that one year that they got like 10 sacks yes. on Matthew Stafford? Like, do that, except like the new <laughs> Lions with Jared Goff under center and all of that. So that's my key. How about you, Rome? What are your keys? Yeah, and I'm playing off her key when she brought up Evan Brown. Uh, he's, a, he's a young center. You have to use one crowd noise so the crowd is involved in this. Keep it so loud that he can't hear Goff and make sure that when Zimmer puts those guys in the A-gap and he's mugging, actually do it. Because we know he really trusts Anthony Barr up there. And so when you put him up there, confuse that young center so that he doesn't know who he's supposed to block. So you end up with a jailbreaks blitz and you just cr create more frustration for golf so when they end up in third and long. But you got to confuse Evan Brown. Prediction? Oh, they're going to lose by a lot. No, I think it'll be 24 <laughs> to, to like 10. How about you, Courtney? I picked them today at ESPN.com, 30 to 21 Vikings. Ooh. All right. Maybe 10 sacks? How many sacks? I didn't go that far, but Golf I mean, this, is, the this is a team that, you know, the Vikings have averaged, um, you know, 12 points per game on the Lions in each of those last seven wins that we mentioned at the beginning of the show. So I think it'll be another big win for them. They need to get back on track here, though. Two games coming up before the bye. Absolutely. And of course, we've learned from Andre Patterson that it's not all about the sacks, right? So it doesn't really matter right. how many they get. It's as long as the pressures are there, the defense is there, and let's get the offense back on track. Well, that'll do it for Vikings Live tonight. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, PA, of course. And of course, to Tyler Conklin. We hope he does indeed get that second touchdown. But right now, we're going to take a look live at Lumen Field in Seattle, the Thursday night football game coming up. You're very first on Fox and of course we were looking at a big competition Stafford versus Wilson now Matthew Stafford gets his first taste of this rivalry and this is a place he's never won in so it'll be interesting to see if indeed he won't be sacked 10 times he can come out with a victory in dangerous territory and of course he's coming off a lost Arizona but Russell Wilson and company coming off a victory after they snapped their two-game losing streak so it it is set up to be a big time game. You guys, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Stick around for Thursday Night Football on Fox. Rams and Seahawks coming at you next. Vikings Live.